So the question was that, you know, that is an extra advantage because what happens is that there is a drain and there is a source. The input is at the source, the output is at the drain, but the in-between terminal gate is actually grounded. So therefore, the Miller capacitance actually gets grounded, right? So therefore, its AC performance is better. AC performance of the upper transistor is better. That is, of course, given. But the point is, right now, we are talking of the DC gain and even the DC gain is boosted, okay? And the contribution to the boosting of the DC gain is through increasing the output uh, in the output resistance of this, okay? So that is what is happening. Essentially, if there is a fluctuation of voltage here, there will be a current fluctuation here. This current fluctuation will be the same as the GM of the M1. And th because they are in series, the same current flows through both. Right? So therefore, the effective GM of these two transistors is the same as the GM of this transistor. On the other hand, the G0 is multiplied by the common, well, common uh, mode gain, common base gain, common gate gain of this transistor. Okay? So G0 is improved, GM remains the same. So the overall gain is therefore the product of the two gains. Okay, GM remained the same, G0 got multiplied, therefore the gain also got multiplied. Right? G0 got reduced, R0 got multiplied. Okay? So this is the product of the two gains. So in short, the gain is the product of the two gains, the GM is the same, because GM is the same, GM by C is the same. Okay? So it will if it is loaded externally, then while the Miller capacitance will make have a lower impedance, but the uh, cutoff frequency is decided by external load. Okay, so now the external load will decide the frequency, and your output impedance is high, and therefore the bandwidth will be lower. Okay, you can also do this by just putting the transistor model across here. Okay, so this is the lower transistor. On top of that is the upper transistor. This is C zero. You do it using networks, you get the same result. Okay, so now we have got, got something good, but there is a bit of a problem with this. And that is that the DC voltages are not compatible. Remember, this input voltage will be somewhere above VTN so that we get into the linear regime. Right? So this will be somewhere, say, within a volt of ground. But this voltage is much higher because there is a full VDS in series with that. Therefore, the output DC, the fluctuation has got amplified, but the output DC is very high. And therefore, it cannot be directly connected to the next stage. Okay? If you want to do capacitive coupling, then large capacitors cannot be put on chip. Okay? So, this is a big problem with the ordinary so-called telescopic cascode. This is called a telescopic cascode, but it looks like a telescope, these two portions one on top of the other. Okay? So, the DC compatibility in a multi-stage amplifier is difficult. Okay? So, the first question I ask is, is this a good differential amplifier? Okay? And actually, it is not a good differential amplifier, but you should ask your students, is this a good differential amplifier? They must first appreciate that this is not a good differential amplifier. Otherwise, you know, you teach them some very complicated circuit and they say, why is all this complication necessary? Right? So, first they must appreciate that a simple solution is not a good solution. Okay? So, what I am suggesting is that I take two transistors like this. I apply VI1 here, VI2 here. Okay? These two transistors are identical. These resistors are identical. Therefore, their gains are identical. Okay? So, V01 is A times VI1. V02 is A times VI2. Therefore, the difference of this. So, A times V02 minus V01. Okay? The V02 minus V01 is just A times V01 minus V02. So, it is a good differential amplifier. So, why don't we simply use this? What is the problem? Can you spot the problem? Why can't we use this? as a differential amplifier. Otherwise, this is so simple rather than all that long tail pair, three current source, all sorts of loads and so on. So, why is this not a good di differential amplifier? Okay, you can read the answer off the top, but also try to apply your mind. What happens is that not only do we want high differential gain, we wanted to ignore any common mode voltage. 
That means if the same voltage is applied to both the terminals, then it should not affect the gain of this, right? In this case, what happens is that suppose I raise both the, I have the same differential voltage, but suppose I raise both of these voltages, let's say by half a volt, right? The differential is the same, but the absolute value DC value of both the gates is raised by half a volt. What will happen to the current? Current will be much higher in both of them and the gain depends on current, right? So even though the output will be proportional to the input difference, the differential output will still be proportional to the differential input. But that proportionality constant, which is the gain, depends on the common mode voltage. Therefore, this circuit will respond to common mode voltage. It will not ignore the common mode voltage. As a result, its common mode, mode rejection will be very poor. That is why we do not use this for as a differential amplifier. Otherwise, very simple. That is also why that if you do not want to worry about common mode voltage, this is actually a good differential amplifier and should be used. Okay? For example, many circuits in the uh, these earphone amplifiers for you know uh, hearing aids and so on, they need to work till the battery becomes very, very low. Okay, so that the battery life is enhanced. And common mode voltage does not matter. The bias is not going to change a lot there. They often use this circuit as a differential amplifier. Okay, it is because it saves, there is no voltage drop across a current source at the bottom. Okay, so these decisions are not automatic that this is a differential amplifier and therefore use it. How it comes about? This is a possible differential amplifier in certain applications might be a good differential amplifier. Though in a general case in an op amp, it will be very bad. So what we do is we put a current source here. Now because this current source, if these two voltages are same, irrespective of what their absolute values are, if these two voltages are same, they will get the same fraction of this current source. Okay? So we put a current source, then half the current will go here, half the current will go here. As a result, if the common mode voltage changes, the current will not change. Earlier it was grounded, right? but by putting a current source here, even if you change the common mode voltage, the current through each transistor remains the same. Therefore, the gain remains the same. This therefore will be a very good differential amplifier. So, we will use it. Okay, I want to get to the tutorial of this. So, this is an amplifier and for load, it uses this. See, suppose you want a differential output. That means you, two inputs, two outputs. Then that circuit would have been okay. But in reality, what we want is a single output which is proportional to the differential input. Okay? And that is done by this single-ended output. Okay? Now, this is a slightly, not a delicate argument, but you have to look at the details of this, so we will take a minute over this. What is I out? This is the fluctuating current in the output. It is the difference of the current through this and this. Right? This guy sources a certain amount of current, this guy sinks a certain amount of current and the differential is what comes out of the output. Right? So the I out is I of MP2 and from that you subtract I of MN2. Right? So this everyone agrees with? Okay. Now I of MP2 is the same as IMP1 because this is a current mirror. You agree with that? This is a current mirror. Okay? So, these two currents are equal. But I of MP1 is the same as I of MN1 because they are in series. So, the same current has to flow through both. Correct? So, therefore, I can put I, instead of I MP2, I can put I MN1. Right? I of MP2 is same as I of MP1. I of MP1 is same as I MN1. So, I can put I MN1 here. Right? So, the I out is I M N 1 minus I M N 2, right? which is G M times V I 1, that is I M N 1, minus G M times V I 2. Right? So, this is the output current. Now, if I want to define this as a black box, okay, as a difference amplifier, then I define a capital G M, this is a definition, not derivation. Okay? this symbol. 
so I define a G, capital GM such that current is this GM times VI. That's how all GMs are defined, right? The output current is GM times input voltage. Now input voltage is differential. So I define a differential GM such that the I, I output is this GM times the input differential voltage, right? And from inspection, I can simply say that this GM is the same as this GM. Correct? You got it? So the effective GM of a diff amp is the same as the GM of a single transistor. Okay? You don't get twice the gain because you have two transistors. Right? You get the GM of a single transistor as you can see from here. Right? This is the single transistor GM of MN1. This is the single transistor GM of MN2. Take the differential. And if you define capital GM like this, then capital GM is same as the GM of a single transistor, even though you are using two transistors. This part is clear? As soon as that is there, then many things immediately follow. Okay? For example, the GM by C is the cutoff frequency, right? At which the gain will drop. And that is the same as a, that of a single transistor. Now the gain of this output stage, right? That is GM times R. Now if you look at this point, this is at AC ground. There is no fluctuation here. Zero fluctuation. Therefore, this is AC ground. DC at VDD, but AC ground. And so is this point at AC, AC ground. Right? Because of differential amplifier. So then, this resistor and this resistor are effectively in parallel. Okay? So that is the load resistance. GM times the output resistance of MP2 in parallel with output resistance of MN2. Right? That is the R out. R0 of MN2 in parallel with R0 of MP2. Now you know GM R0, you know all that is why we took so much trouble calculating all this formula. The gain can write it written as GM times this parallel combination of R0. Okay? So now we know the gain. So now we arrive finally at the two-stage op amp. Okay? Why do we use two-stage op amps? It makes it decouples the input from the output. Okay? This stage we have already done in great detail up to now. Right? So this stage is optimized to handle the input because it is connected to the input. And this stage can be optimized to handle the output, output capacitance, whatever the load and so on. You design it according to the output. And then the total gain will be the product of the gain of this and this. Okay? So that's why two-stage op amps are popular. And that is what we are going to use. Now this one is not a big deal. This is that single transistor amplifier except that it is inverted. The output of this is connected to the P-channel transistor and this N-channel transistor is acting as a current source. So we have already analyzed this also. Okay? We know all the results for this. So we can just put all those results and the eventual gain is a product of these two gains. So this is what it looks like. You have a differential stage here. It has a capital GM which is GM11 and output stage which is GM22. Okay? So this is the second stage. And now that is the total output gain. This immediately brings a problem. What is the problem? Remember this is a single pole response. So as you pass the bandwidth, the phase will shift by 90 degrees. This is also a single pole response. response. And this also around its bandwidth will shift the phase by 90 degrees. Okay? If now both of these are similar circuit, similar output resistance, similar capacitances and so on. Therefore, these two frequencies are the same, more or less. As a result, around that frequency, you will have 90 degree of phase difference here. 90 degree of phase difference here. You will have an overall phase difference of 180 degrees. Now, an op amp is always used with negative feedback. So, you are using this op amp with negative feedback. And if this guy introduces 180 degrees of phase difference, that negative feedback will become positive feedback. Because internally, the signal has got phase shifted by 180 degrees. You put negative feedback. But because it has got shifted at this frequency by 180 degrees, it will be unstable. It will start oscillating at that frequency if the gain is higher than 1. If the gain is less than 1, then the feedback will not cause any problem. Therefore, we have to make sure that the overall gain, which is dropping with frequency, drops to below 1 before the phase reaches 180 degrees. And that is not very easy to do if both these poles are at the same point. Okay? Why is that so? Have I left you far behind? At 
at what frequency does the phase start changing? Around the bandwidth, right? But at the bandwidth, the gain is near its maximum, right? So around the bandwidth, the phase has already reached 180 degrees, right? But the gain continues to be quite high, not the highest possible, but continues to be quite high at that point. So the overall gain cannot be below 1 before the phase reaches 180. So we have to do something. Okay? And we do it by reducing on purpose the gain of the first stage. If you essentially change the poles of these two so that the pole of the first one is very low and the pole of the second one is very high, then because of the gain reduction has already taken place for the first one, you can make it such that the gain is below 1 when the phase eventually reaches 180 degrees. This is called pole splitting. This is what we will do and we will put a capacitor here between the output and the input that is a Miller capacitor and that will stabilize the gain and if you notice this was already here. Okay? Without this, this will not be very stable. Okay? So this is called op-amp compensation and done by pole splitting. So we have put this capacitor here and you can now analyze this. This is a Miller capacitor. Okay, it is connected between output and input. So its effective value is multiplied by the gain of the second stage. So you can use a small capacitor and it will look like a very large capacitor because of the Miller effect. Okay, so this is the equivalent circuit. Okay, this is the first stage. This is the second stage and connected between the output and input of this is this capacitor. Okay? So what is the gain bandwidth product of the total? This capacitor, the output of this is R and this capacitor has got multiplied by A2. Right? So what is the gain of this? A1. What is the gain of this? A2. And what is the RC time constant? the R0 of this times C times A2 because of the Miller effect. Right? So this is A1 A2 divided by R01 A2 C which is A1 by R01 C. That means the bandwidth is set, gain bandwidth product is set by just this amplifier independent of A2. Right? Essentially what you have done is you have multiplied the capacitor by A2. Right? So the gain has been killed by the same amount that it has been boosted by the second amplifier. Right? So this is occurring in numerator as well as denominator. The killing is because of the RC time constant. So you have boosted the RC time constant by the Miller effect. Okay? You know why the capacitor appears A times in this configuration? Why is the Miller capacitance effectively A times its physical value? No, it should not just be algebra. You should actually make your students appreciate this. What really happens is the following. What is capacitance? Capacitance is the ratio of charge to voltage. Right? So in order to change the voltage by a little bit, how much charge you have to place there? Right? That is what the capacitance is. Now in this case what happens is that suppose I raise this voltage by some delta V. Correct? What happens to this point? it goes minus A times delta V. Right? So effectively across this capacitor, the voltage changes by A times delta V. Actually A plus 1 delta V. Right? So the amount of charge that you have to provide to it is not no more C times delta V. If this guy was a ground, then this guy will have to provide a charge which is C times delta V. But now it has to provide, in order to change the voltage by delta V, it has to provide an amount of charge which is A times C times delta V. Therefore, it appears to it as if a huge capacitor to ground is connected to its output. In order to change its voltage by a small delta V, it has to dump charge which is A times delta V. Right? That is why the Miller capacitance gets multiplied by the gain. Right? This part is clear? Okay? This qualitative appreciation for, for students is very good because then they get a gut feel of what really is happening here. Alright? Now, we let's, let's do the design. Final thing, what is the slew rate? Now, up to now, we have done small signal amplification. We have assumed that the bias is there and you put a small fluctuation there. 
but slew rate is a large signal phenomenon that is to say I apply a step input which is large and I expect the output to go towards the other power supply but because the current is limited the capacitor can be charged only at a certain rate so even though the input is a step the output is a ramp right that is to be expected this is an RC circuit it's an it's a it's an integrator right so that ramp will when you uh, integrate a constant you will get a ramp that is not very surprising okay first pole response second pole response it is an integrator right so that is the question is what is that ramp rate so look at this circuit and see how this capacitor is being charged okay what is the rate of change at this output voltage suppose the input has been given a high voltage so that all the current is switched either through MN1 or through MN2 right this is the current source and such a high voltage has been uh, applied suddenly here that one of these transistors is completely cut off and all the bias current is flowing through the other transistor it could be through this or it could be through this it does not matter that will just change the direction of the output current ok so how much current is being poured in he from here whatever is the bias current here right the differential current because all the current is going through one transistor the differential current is the full current the bias current right so this bias current all the current will go through one and the other will take zero and as we have worked out the output current is mn2 minus mn1 current so the full bias current is the output from here right so what is the c dv by dt here the effective value of c here is a2 times c right so a2 times c times dv by dt that is the bias current right that is the rate of change of voltage at this particular point right therefore dv by dt is i upon a to c, a to c. but this dv by dt is multiplied by the gain of the second stage therefore the dv by dt at this point is i divided by a to c into a2 right and finally that is just i by c right a2 cancels again from numerator denominator this part is clear this total current is charging a capacitor which is c times a2 therefore c times a2 into dv by dt that is the current output of this therefore dv by dt is this i mn4 divided by a2 by c that is the dv by dt at this point this dv by dt is multiplied by the gain of this stage so therefore i divided by a2 c into a2 so a2 cancels and you get i by c right so that is what this is right so therefore the final slew rate of our op amp is controlled by the bias of the first stage and this compensation capacitor that we have put there ok now we are ready to design our first op amp these are our design equations this is just a compilation of what we have derived up to now but one now we must worry about the bias ok so this is a slightly delicate argument and I will just uh, go through this the rest is straightforward we will just derive those values ok so, so this let us see very carefully first look at this transistor the drain is connected to gate agreed ok this is like Arjun look at the eye of the bird and do not look at any of anything else ok then you will be able to concentrate so look only at MP1 the drain is shorted with gate ok what is the saturation condition that the drain voltage is larger than Vg minus Vt right but because it is equal to Vg it is always larger than Vg, Vg, Vg minus Vt right the drain voltage is the same as Vg therefore the drain voltage is always larger than Vg minus Vt therefore this transistor is always saturated ok so this is the ideal we want all transistors saturated so you want every transistor to emulate this ok so I do not know how many of you are elder brothers or elder sisters of the family I am so you have that extra responsibility of being the bada bhai that everybody says why are you doing such a thing your siblings will also do that so you have to be a good boy all the time so this is our good boy MP1 is our good boy it is always saturated we want others to be to follow him ok alright now look at MP2 again concentrate only on MP2 now 
we want MP2 to be like MP1, then this will also be saturated. Okay. Now compare MP2 and MP1. Their source voltage are the same. Check. Their gate voltage are the same. Check. And their currents are the same. Check. And these transistors are identical. Right? And what have we said? That if current is the same, the geometry is the same and the gate voltage is the same, then the drain voltage must be the same. Otherwise, how will they have equal current? Therefore, this voltage is the same as this voltage. This is the first argument. Okay? This is a series of delicate arguments. You must establish each one in the minds of your students and only then go ahead. Okay? So, what have we established? That this voltage is equal to this voltage. Everybody agrees with this? Therefore, MP2 is automatically saturation. No problem there. The problem is with MP3. Okay? So now again concentrate on MP3 alone. MP1, MP2 we have taken care of. Concentrate on MP3 alone. The source voltage is the same as MP1. Okay? The gate voltage is equal to this voltage, which is equal to this voltage, which is this gate voltage. Therefore, the gate voltage is also the same. This transistor, the gate voltage is this drain voltage, which is equal to this drain voltage, which is the gate voltage of both. Correct? So, therefore, this transistor has the same source voltage and the same gate voltage as these two transistors. Right? Therefore, if its drain voltage is also the same, then this will also be guaranteed to be saturation, in saturation. Right? But in this case, the current is not the same. Right? So, we can't give that argument. Therefore, what we say is that if the geometry ratio of this with respect to these two is the same as the current ratio. Okay? So, in short, let us say that the current ratio is 5 is to 1. That means this transistor draws 5 times as much current and is 5 times as wide. Then I can consider MP3 to be a parallel connection of 5 transistors. Agreed? Then each transistor, each component transistor also has the same current as this because there are 5 those, 5 of those. Now that argument applies. Right? Source voltage is same, gate voltage is same and current is the same. Therefore, the drain voltage must be the same. Right? So, if I ensure that the geometry ratio between MP3 and MP2 is the same as the current ratio between MP3 and MP2, then I will guarantee that MP3 is saturated. Is this argument clear? It is a two-step argument. Right? Therefore, you must appropriately build it up in the class. So, what are we saying? Just to go quickly over it again, this transistor is always saturated, argument number one. Argument number two, these two transistors have the same source voltage, the same gate voltage and the same current. Therefore, the drain voltages must be the same. Therefore, this voltage is the same as this voltage. Okay? Therefore, this is also saturated. So, even though there is no short here, there is a virtual short between these two. Okay? Argument number three, this transistor has the same source voltage as this. It has the same gate voltage as this because this voltage is the same as this voltage which is the gate voltage. And the geometry ratio is the same as current ratio. Therefore, its drain voltage must also be the same. Okay? So, if you can ensure that the geometry of this is in the same ratio as the bias current of the two stages, then you will have all transistors saturated. Okay? Which is what we want to do to get high gain. Alright? Now, we can design this. Let us take, take an actual number tutorial that puts everything in your head like nobody's business. Okay, so let us take K prime in n channel to be 120 microamps per volt squared. This is not unusual, by the way, for a 0.35 micron technology, half micron, not a very modern technology. So this is not a very bad number to take. Okay, so let's say that K prime n is 120 microamps per volt squared. Okay, let us take K prime p to be half as much. Okay, this we discussed yesterday also. You very often take the p channel mobility to be half that of n channel mobility. Let us take it as 60. These are just numbers. You could have chosen other numbers. This is just to illustrate. Okay? I am just simply saying that these numbers are reasonable of actual technologies. 
take the two VTMs to be plus minus 0.4 though that we will not be using at all. We want to design an op amp whose DC gain is 80 dB, whose gain bandwidth product is 50 megahertz and whose slew rate is 20 volts per microsecond. Okay? These are the specifications given to us. Let us go ahead and now design it. Now the order is very important and what you do is that you design based on those specifications which involve the least number of specifications so that the specifications do not come out as simultaneous equations. You can directly nail something. Okay? So that is what we are going to do. Okay. First, this is an arbitrary choice and we may have to iterate over it if it does not work out. You choose the value of this capacitor. Okay, the compensation capacitor and we have taken a value of 2 PF here which is quite representative. Okay, if, it, if things do not work out you may have to try various values of this capacitor and later sometime we will discuss how to choose this capacitor. But right now let us take a value 2 PF. Also we assume that the bias current in the second stage is 5 times this current that means 10 times this. There is an order of magnitude of difference between the bias current of this and bias current of this single transistor okay because this is two times therefore five times between these okay this is also fairly standard but this is what i meant by a two stage op amp essentially the in output drives a healthy load so it needs heavy healthy current so the current through this is one order of magnitude higher this is an assumption that we have made okay if we don't meet specs we'll come back and revise this uh, <coughs> all right First, from the slew rate, how much is the slew rate? I by C. We just worked that out, right? Depends only on the first stage because the gain of the second stage got cancelled out, right? So that is the this bias current divided by C. That should be the slew rate, right? Slew rate is given to us. What is slew rate? 20 volts per microsecond. This 20 volts per microsecond. This is the slew rate. And this is the capacitance 2 PF. So C dV by dt that directly gives us 40 microns. Okay? That means this cur this transistor should take 40 microns. This is clear enough. So we have already put the current through this transistor to be 40 microns. Now in DC case, these two currents must be equal. So there is 20 microns through this. 20 microamps through this and because these are in series there is 20 microamps through this and 20 microamps through this right because this guy draws 10 times the current there is 200 microamps through this and because it is in series there is 200 microamps through this you got it at this point we know the current through every single transistor okay in this configuration we know the current through every single transistor this is 40 2020, 2020, 200, 200. This part is clear, then I will proceed. <coughs> now the gain bandwidth also is determined by this. Right? We have seen that the gain of the second stage drops out, gain bandwidth. In fact, gain bandwidth and slew rate are the small signal and high signal, large signal components of the same characteristic. Right? So the loading of loading by C, it is GM by C. Right? So the effective C is multiplied by A2 because of the Miller effect and the overall gain is also multiplied by A2. So therefore the effective gain bandwidth product of the whole op amp is the same as the gain bandwidth product of this taking C rather than the Miller capacitor. Right? So GM by C is given gain bandwidth product but C is also given therefore GM is given. Right? So that is what we calculate. From the gain bandwidth requirement what was the GBW? 50 megahertz. So corresponding value of omega is 2 pi into 50 into 10 to the power 6, right? And that is GM by C. So that is the GM of MN2. We know that the differential GM is the same as the differential of a single transistor. We had established that. So that is GM of MN2 divided by C, which is 2 PF. Correct? Now this gives us the GM, right? So how much is GM? 628 micro Siemens. Okay, so you know the GM of this. Okay, these two are identical, therefore their GMs must be the same. 
their currents and everything must be the same. Now to get a GM of 628 micro, micro, micro Siemens, GM, this is one of those equations that we had derived, right? So that is 2 K prime into W by L into ID, right? That was that is what we had derived, derived 2 K into ID square root, right? In this case, we have current bias, therefore this is the expression that we have used, which depends on ID, right? So 2 K prime is K times W by L into ID which we have already calculated 20 microamps, right? This should be equal to 628 micro Siemens, which we just derived. So the only unknown here is W by L, which you can calculate, comes out about 82. Okay? So now I know the W by L of this, which is 82. W by L of this is also 82. We know the current through this, right? And we know the early voltages. Now as you know, G0 was that current by voltage, right? So if you know the current, how much is the current? 20 microamps. And the early voltage is given to be 20 volts, right? So the output resistance of each one of the, these, right? The G0 is 1 micro mo, 1 micro Siemens, right? 20 microamps divided by 20 volts, straightforward. And we know that the effective load is the load of this and this in output resistance of this and this in parallel. Correct? So the RL is 2 micro Siemens. Right? So the gain of the first stage is now known. You know the GM, you know RL. GM times RL. Right? So GM is how much? 628. GM by G0. Correct? This is the first thing that we derived, GM by G0. So GM is 628 micromoles. The uh, G0 is 2 micromoles. So the effective gain of this stage, okay, of the first stage will be about 300 here, right? So the overall gain, right? What is the G0 of this? 10 times, because it has 10 times the current, right? So G0 of this is 20 micromoles. Correct? So therefore the gain of this first stage is 628 by 2. Gain of the second stage is GM divided by G0 and G0 is 20 micromoles. Right? And this is the total DC gain which must be 10,000. Agreed? So this is the only unknown GM. Correct? So now I know the GM of MP3. Okay? What is the GM of MP3? Comes out about 637 micro Siemens. Quick repetition, overall gain is the product of the gains of the two stages. Because we know current through all the transistors and we know the early voltage, we know the R0 of every transistor, G0 of every transistor, right? We know the GM of this transistor, we know the gain of the first stage is GM628 micro, GM came from gain bandwidth product, okay? So 628 divided by 2, this is the gain of the first stage and GM divided by 20 micromoles. Each one of these transistors has 10 micromoles as the uh, G0. Right? So, six, so this GM divided by 20 microns, micromoles, that should give me 10,000. Therefore, this should be about 637 micromoles. Okay? This part is clear. Now I know the GM of this transistor. Now you know, if you know GM and you know I, then you can calculate the geometry. Right? So that is what we do next. So to get a GM of 637 micromoles with a drain current of 200 micromoles, then 637 micromoles equal to 2 into kt prime. This is a p-channel transistor. Right? So 60 microamps per volt squared times W by L times 200. Right? That is the current which is flowing through this. 200 microamps. Right? 200 into 10 minus 6. That gives you the W by L of about 17. Okay? So now I know the W by L of this. But we promised that the W by L ratio of this and this these will be the same as the current ratio. Therefore, each one of these transistors should be one tenth the width of this. Right? The current is one tenth, 220. Therefore, W by L also should be one tenth. So, therefore, the W by L of this is 1.7 and W by L of this is 1.7. Okay? At this stage, we know the bias currents through both the stages. We know the geometry and current of this, 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 geometry and current of this. Okay? As designers, what is our final job? 
to find the bias and to find the W by L. Then you have designed the transistor. Now we know the W by L. Now this bias, this bias generation Madam Shujai will be doing later with you. Okay? But this bias, assume that there is a reference transistor of W by L4 which they, these are mirroring and which carries 10 microamps just for the sake of calculating. So if that is so, okay, we assume that an n-type reference bias transistor of W by L equal to 4 is available with a current of 10 microamps. Okay? And these are mirroring the current for this. Okay? So this guy will then have to be what size? This is 40 microamps, right? 20 plus 20. So 4 times the size. Therefore, its W by L will be 16. Right? A W by L of 4 gives you 10 microamps. Therefore, a w, w by L of 16 will give you uh, the required 40 microamps. Correct? And similarly, this has to be 160. Sorry, 80. It is 5 times the current of this, 10 times of this. Right? So, this, this is 16, this is 80. At this stage, we have calculated everything. Okay? Finally, what is the gain? Gain is the product of two GMR zeros. Right? Therefore, very often people say, why bother with a two-stage op-amp? Why not just simply use a cascode? The cascode gain was also the product of two GMR zeros. Okay? But to make it differential, then people very often make a differential cascode which looks like this. Okay? We will not get into the detail of this. It is designed very similarly, but we will not get into the details of this. Okay? So now you know how to design. Now during the lab tomorrow, we will take this same design. Okay? Now notice that we have made very bold approximations. We have said G0 is directly proportional, everything is linear, these equations apply, these equations apply to a 0.35 microns, such very simple equations, they apply. Okay? So the real design will deviate quite a bit from that. Okay? So really then you will have to fine tune. But it will give us a very good initial design from which most of the specs have already been met. And then the job of the designer is to fine tune, fine tune, tweak, tweak the currents, tweak the geometries till you get the response that you want. Okay? So that is what we will do next. We will stop here. There is one final point that I want to make. And that is this. In op-amp design, we have assumed that the stability depends on the value of this capacitor. Right? And what is the capacitor value? The physical value multiplied by the gain of the second stage. Okay? Now we have multiplied it by what? By the DC gain of the second stage. In reality, this gain will stop dropping. As a result, this capacitor will look like a large capacitor at DC, but will look like a smaller and smaller capacitor at higher frequencies. Therefore, you may often find that this capacitor is inadequate to make your op-amp very stable. So after you have done this paper design, very often you may have to go and fiddle. After all, the value of this capacitor was an arbitrary decision that we took right in the beginning. So after you have done the design, you may have to go and tweak the value of this capacitor till you get the stability that you want.